Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Terry Maxwell and I'm delighted that you've uh, made time to join us today. I'm a health tech investor and am constantly searching for new and innovative both technologies and concepts that I believe are uh, revolutionizing the healthcare space. Today, I'm excited to bring to you Jacob Corbell. He is Executive Vice President for the Cardiovascular Institute of the South. He brings more than 10 years of healthcare experience and has worked tirelessly to develop, to develop their telecardiology program, as well as the remote monitoring program to increase access to care. Jacob joined CIS in 2012 as part of the MBA Healthcare Administration Program and he later became the executive lead for strategic corporate initiatives for the Institute. Prior to joining the Institute, Jacob worked for the state of Louisiana, and he was responsible for designing behavioral health interventions for inpatient and outpatient settings. Jacob also spent more than three years delivering patient care as a case manager in acute care and outpatient clinics. Jacob, welcome to today's webinar, and uh, I'm just gonna let you take it from here. Okay, thank you, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, appreciate the introduction. Um, so in the room with me today, I also am joined with two of our nurse practitioners in our 24-7 virtual care center, uh, Marcus Monte and Kyle Laverne. Um, they uh, help carry out these programs as we scale them. Um, the, the one I'm going to be talking on today is was our initial implementation at a 110-bed hospital uh, in Opelousas, Louisiana, uh, over a six-month period. And uh, I'll speak to that, uh, how we did it, what we learned, and, and what our plans are for the future. And, and Kyle and Marcus will join, uh, you know, this webinar, especially as it relates to, to clinical issues. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started here. Obviously, the title of today's presentation is Comprehensive Cardiology Care Delivered Virtually how you can use remote patient management as an effective solution for CHF and, and AMI patients. So as we get started here, I just want to quickly tell you about the Institute and, and what we do. Um, our mission is to provide our patients with the highest quality cardiovascular care available. We keep it very simple. Uh, that way we can stay on task. You know, five of our core pledges are technological superiority, research, education, compassion, and communication. Uh, these, this mission has been the same mission uh, when we started back in 1983 with one physician. Um, so here's our current markets. As you can see, we have a, a large presence in South Louisiana. Uh, we have a telemedicine program in Marshall, Texas, and a non-physician group in Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, and then we manage Shelby uh, Baptist Hospital in Alabaster, Alabama. We manage their uh, cardiovascular product line. We have seven telecardiology programs uh, placed at satellite and remote hospitals where we do uh, emergency department consultations 24-7. So a little bit about our service strategy. Um, we have a, a virtual care center, a 24-7 nursing center that is staffed with nurses, nurse practitioners, and soon-to-be physicians. Uh, we do our telecardiology there. We, we have our, our app um, that, that patients have access to on an iOS and Android operating systems. And then we have the Cardio at Home program, which is the program I'll be talking about today. Um, we use different interventions in this Cardio at Home program, everything from, from actually implanting devices that, that manages and, and gives us indicators on heart failure patients to uh, remote patient monitoring, such as Vivify Health. The mission of this program that we defined several several years ago was to provide highly specialized and individualized care for cardiac patients, improving their quality of life while reducing hospital costs. The reason why we wanted to emphasize specialized and individualized is that we are a cardiology practice. We are a physician practice made up of 56 cardiologists, uh, the majority of them being interventional cardiologists. We do have a few non-invasive guys, but we are a cardiology group and that's what we do well, and, and so that's, that's why that mission is so, so specialized, because we are talking about heart failure and, and patients with acute MI. We accomplish this mission with real continuity of care. These are our patients that are discharging from these hospitals. Therefore, um, it's a patient that, that sometimes we've been treating for several years, uh, and the idea that when that patient gets hospitalized and leaves that hospital, 
you know, who better to take care of that patient than the physician who's been managing them for, for years. Increased access to care. We are offering these kits to, to all patients, um, whether they're ours or not. And, and we hope that that, that that does a couple things. One, it keeps those patients out of the hospital by a tried and true method, as well as exposes them to our physician practice so we can grow that way. We have a multidisciplinary team made up of, of physicians, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, pharmacists, uh, home health agencies, and then the hospital staff, such as their case management team. And then state-of-the-art technology being the fourth way in which we accomplish the mission. Um, and in this case, the Vivify Health Kit. So the initial implementation was over a six-month time frame at Opelousas General Health System. I apologize. I wish I'd have done a map here, but it's a that is a 110 bed, 120 bed hospital in South Central Louisiana. It's about 20 miles north of Lafayette, Louisiana, and about 60 miles south of Alexandria, Louisiana. So it sits right in the South Central pocket in a parish called St. Landry. Uh, the time frame in which we tracked this program was June 1st to December 1st, and we just uh, gave this kit to to CHF and acute my patients. I'm going to quickly go over. Um, this program and how we actually did it. Um, uh, you know, part of this could be the secret sauce, and part of it really is just our efforts to to help share with you guys what worked. Uh, we think there's value in that. You know, the, the patient was identified um, for the program, you know, with the CIS hospital staff. So a little bit about us. While we do not uh, own or operate hospitals, we do have a, uh, in, in a lot of hospitals, what's called a co-management agreement where our physician group actually manages the cardiovascular product line. I mentioned that in Alabama, we have 11 of those such relationships. So what we do is we actually embed cardiovascular into the South employees into that hospital. We could employ the cath lab director, the nurses, uh, rounding nurses, the nurse practitioners, uh, and always the physician. So in this case, this hospital, we actually do, we employ uh, a nurse practitioner, four physicians, and three registered nurses. Those nurses on site touch and see every cardiovascular patient. So any patient that's admitted with a cardiology need, we see them and touch them. So, so they're the ones who actually confirm the eligibility of these patients and enroll them. So here's how we identified it. They were identified at admission. So as soon as one of these patients was admitted with these diagnoses, one of our folks was alerted. We saw the patient. Uh, we then went over our inclusion exclusion criteria. And in this case, really, the, the way you were included was if you had that diagnosis at admission and you were willing able to participate. That was it. The exclusion criteria was, was an untreated psych diagnosis, a refusal to participate, and then a GFR of less than 30. And, and I'll let Kyle or Marcus speak to why that mattered for us in initial implementation. I think the uh, when, when looking at the GFR, I think that's going to be the, the major one that we're looking at. Uh, so we talked to several of the medical directors, and these patients are usually your uh, chronic hemodialysis patients who tend to uh, be readmitted uh, pretty easily uh, due to other medical conditions besides uh, cardiac conditions. Um, so they have varied comorbid conditions. Um, so the actually the administration, the medical director for the administration, uh, asked that we put that as part of the exclusion criteria. And also, we wanted to make sure that the patients that we selected were would be compliant, as 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 you can figure, compliance is of utmost importance. And without their compliance, you know, the 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 goal that we were willing to achieve uh, would not have been made. That's right. I, I think for us, especially in the early early stage, uh, we wanted to make sure we were going to have a good group. And and again, I mean, keep in mind, just those three things the only way to be excluded. And, and we did not eliminate any payers. So we. We funded this program with our own dollars, provided the kits and the resources and the oversight, uh, really just to capture this data and do a case study. So, so a lot of people were included, uh, not many were excluded. And uh, that patient, this cardio at home program was, was actually ordered and placed on the discharge for the patient when they left. Um, the CIS hospital staff, again, that identified this patient would contact our, we have a remote patient management nurse inside of our 24-7 virtual care center. Um, at the time, it was called the call center. Sometimes it's still called the call center. We're shifting that to our virtual care center. But the hospital staff would, would let the, the remote patient management nurse know, I have a patient here, send them some basic information, and let them know that they were about to introduce them to the kit. 
hospital staff then would, I'm getting into some of the weeds here and, and I won't spend too much time on it, but a, a new patient chart was started and an actual Vivify kit number was assigned to that patient. The reason we assigned that kit to that patient was so that we could go ahead and individualize their care plan while the patient was still in the hospital. Hospital staff, which was cross-trained on the Vivify equipment and the program, would meet with the patient in their room, uh, educate them on it, actually go through a full care plan with them, stand on the scale, take their blood pressure, uh, get their, their oximetry, go ahead and get everything done in the hospital so that we could identify any issues perhaps with the patient understanding. Um, and that also gave us some baseline data um, uh, you know, for, their, for the, the tenure of their plan. So we educated them on site in the hospital. Uh, that way, two things could happen. One, if the patient did choose to enroll and met our criteria, we could inform the remote patient management nurse in our call center to do a virtual introduction with the patient while in the hospital. We felt this was important for several reasons. One, it allowed the relationship to begin. You know, the idea that the patient was going to be monitored for the next 45 days by somebody different concerned us. And so we wanted the nurse who would be monitoring them, would be seeing them and managing their care to actually meet them while in the hospital. So the remote patient management nurse would beam in have a conversation with the patient, get to know them a little bit. That was the one the reason why it was so important. And two, we felt like the patient needed to leave the hospital with the kit. We felt like compliance and enrollment would significantly drop off if they left the hospital and then received the kit later. The remote patient management nurse in our virtual center would then complete the patient chart in the Vivify system, and they would schedule their follow-up office visit. Um, if the patient had an acute MI, they would be here within one to two days at the most. Uh, if they were a congestive heart failure patient, within 72 hours. Those were our benchmarks. Now, what we're doing now is that remote patient management nurse is actually providing the patient with a one-page document that spells out the date of their office appointment, everybody's name and contact number, all the information they need for the, the, the majority of their, or for the entirety of their plan, and so that the patient leaves with the kit and all of her dates and all of her contact information in hand. We felt like one, back to this slide, the importance of this was the patient needed to see the doctor as quickly as possible. Um, and so that's why we said it, said it like that. So then the monitoring begins. And, and, and for those who are Vivify customers, you're familiar with the monitoring package they offer. If you're not, there's a, there's a couple little things I'll show you. One, this is just a, an old schematic of what the, our nursing call center look like. We do have a, uh, a video wall and we have nurses who sit um, in stadium style seating where they're monitoring patient data. This room is protected in a bunker style environment from, from that patient data being seen, but it's a very interactive, collaborative environment with LPNs, RNs, techs, telemetry techs, and nurse practitioners. Um, some of the basic you know, things that, that uh, was provided on the patient were these scores and overall health score. Obviously, you could track the data of blood pressure. And, and I'd like for Kyler Marcus to speak to a little bit about you know, why this stuff matters so much from a provider standpoint. Yeah, so the, the matrix and the vitals that we're able to obtain are pertinent, re relevant, and crucial to make decisions on the patient's health care. But also in, to, to keep in mind that these patients are our patients, so we are uh, familiar with the patients. We have a, a chart that we can refer back to. We have uh, other diagnostic testing that we've done in the past that we can refer to. And it allows us to make an educated decision on these patients. Um, obviously, you know, there's no uh, specific model or matrix that would say if the patient's blood pressure is high or the heart rate this, um, or what would qualify the patient to return back to the hospital. So therefore, we have to utilize all of our resources that we have available to make an educated decision on that patient. And then to go one step further, if we feel as though we need to do or perform a virtual visit to have a face-to-face -face communication with the patient, that we can do so and would also provide us additional information to further uh, treat or um, accommodate the patient's needs. And, and I think from uh, our physician standpoint, uh, the physicians who are seeing this patient in the clinic um, knew that, that uh, they're being monitored um, religiously around the clock. And what they were also impressed with is that they had so much more information at their fingertips when seeing the patient. Um, so they didn't just have the, the vital signs, so to speak, of when they left the, 
the hospital to today, they had everything that happened in between. We could go back and look at things and then make better decisions on behalf of the patient. It provided an adequate trend to better assess that patient. Okay. Yeah, so very helpful information. And, and while we don't have an integration with Vivify, um, you know, I think that's something that's, that's in the works, but we're able to easily get this information from their web-based, uh, you know, solution to our EHR with, with minimal issues. Um, so that remote patient management nurse is following an established escalation criteria. So if on day eight, uh, the patient's blood pressure gets out of whack or they went, if, if they gained four or five pounds, obviously those are clear alerts for us for our heart failure patients. And so there was a, a clear escalation criteria put in place if there were any paid, you know, changes in patient status. This basically went from the nurse practitioner who was in the call center would review it first, and then the physician whose patient it was would immediately, immediately be contacted there um, if there were any changes in status on, on how we should proceed. 100% of the time, if appropriate, we always try to get the patient to come to the clinic and see us in the outpatient setting, or we would in fact alert home health uh, so that they could go in and perhaps provide some medications in the home or IV Lasix, whatever the need may be, uh, anything except for going to the hospital. Um, anything on the escalation criteria? I mean, I think it's pretty cut and dry. It was something that our docs and our team came up with that was very specific to the condition. Um, the remote patient management nurse would inform the patient when the monitoring was near completion and when to return the kit. Um, and, and, and that was really the, the program in a nutshell. It's obviously very high level. There's a lot of things in the, in the weeds there I didn't want to go over, but you get, you get the gist. Um, so when we look at the outcomes here um, of the patients that, that, that did get this kit and did receive this monitoring, uh, we had a 3.2% readmission rate for heart failure, 0% readmission rate for acute MI. Now, that was seven. That number was seven over a six-month period, and none of them came back. Patient compliance on the kits was 75%. The, the, the total N was 35. So we had 28 with congestive heart failure, seven with acute MI diagnosis, and in 100% in, in of those patients, we did actually stent the patient. Uh, with the with the acute MI uh, in the cath lab as well, um, but those were the numbers that that was the data that came back uh, from this this initial implementation, um, and and believe it or not, the the one patient that did come back, um, it was for a urinary tract infection and had nothing to do with their 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 cardiology diagnosis. <clears throat> um, so I. I want to go over in in some detail here the the lessons learned. We're moving quicker than than I anticipated, which is okay. It may allow for some question and answer at the end, but I, I do wanna go over some lessons learned here. Uh, first being, construct a very precise inclusion criteria and very precise clinical pathways. You know, as we started, we started learning as we went that maybe our inclusion criteria should have been buttoned up a little bit more. Um, the, the clinical pathways, meaning that escalation criteria I spoke of, uh, we were kind of adjusting as we went. And, and it's not always easy to grab a physician and everybody sit down at the table and come up with this. So now, again, lessons learned in this initial implementation, we've got some very clear clinical pathways and a more precise criteria, but this is key in the management of that patient. I'd say it's the most important thing. Another thing was a, a thorough peso, patient assessment to include psychosocial and socioeconomic factors. I, I think for us, we all know if we're in this, on this call and interested in, in hospital readmissions and population health, um, there are so many factors that affect the patient. There are so many different scenarios in their environment which can lead them back to the hospital. I think one thing that we really took away from this is we need to do more thorough assessments on this patient to clearly identify all of the needs that would bring them back. Everything from family support, uh, you know, substance use disorder issues in the past, um, maybe things like uh, faith-based in institutions that they connect to and, and all the neighborhood they live in, the closest urgent care, all these different factors. Um, you know, one, one thing we learned here is, is it's hard to expect a patient uh, to be compliant with their health care when they don't even know if they have enough money to eat dinner that night. And, and I think for us, having them a holistic approach and, and the ability to, to connect with a patient who may have issues beyond, obviously, their diagnosis and which brings them to us, 
uh, the better we can take care of that person. Um, so, so that's one thing we also learn. Hospital ancillary service engagement. Again, we talk about palliative care, home health, pharmacy, and hospital case management. That was our multidisciplinary team. Um, I think that we, we had those partners aligned when we came in. Those partners became a little less engaged as we continued through the program. And, and I don't know if you guys want to speak to the importance of that multidisciplinary team, but, but maybe some feedback on the clinical side about why it's so important to have these folks on board. I think it's imperative to have everyone on board when you come to, uh, to these patients because they can be readmitted for several different reasons. So if we have, you know, uh, all hands on deck, so to speak, I, I think it's very beneficial. Um, you know, for one example, um, I think having pharmacy on board, let's just talk about pharmacy real quick. Having pharmacy on board is very important because one of the major reasons from the cardiac standpoint that uh, a lot of people tend to be readmitted for acute MIs um, is because they have problems with medication. So that's why we want to get the pharmacy department involved with them uh, to sit down, counsel the patient, explain to them the medication. So the way we had it uh, done was the, the nurse, I honestly, you know, gives the medications. Uh, the nurse practitioner upon discharge goes and discusses medications. And then the pharmacist went and reiterated that from their aspect. Um, studies show that um, when the pharmacist has a direct consultation with the patient, the patient is going to be more compliant. So that's just one example of how we felt that the ancillary services needed to be engaged um, because this is, this is all a team approach. You know, we want to try to keep the patients out of the hospital, give them the best possible care, but we need assistance from everyone else. I would agree with that. And, and moving forward as far as for palliative care, you know, most of these, especially heart failure side of things, are, are a progressive disease. And, you know, as best as we can manage it, manage it, it will progress despite uh, our effort. Um, so for giving the patient knowledge on their disease or their, their illnesses is uh, crucial because that the patient can have a better understanding of the progression and, and moving forward and how the treatment processes will, will become and, and, and are planned and will be uh, performed. And I, I think the one that we also didn't talk about there was hospital case management. I think most of the strategies that we've encountered, at least in our markets where we serve as hospitals, is the case management team is responsible for the readmission reduction strategy. Not always, but in some cases. And typically that looked like the hospital case manager would find out who was discharged and would, would have a series of phone calls with that patient. And um, you know this happened in the majority of our hospitals. And I think engaging that case management team to one, acquire a more thorough inpatient assessment that maybe we didn't see on the cardiac side, but also let them know that, hey, when they discharge now, you know, work with us to make sure we're not calling the patient virtually, you're still calling the patient, and we're bombarding this patient with too much information post-discharge um, so we can better align our efforts uh, moving forward. We also learned that we needed to allocate a full-time employee for overall coordination and management. When we, when we initially implemented, um, we were using this cardiac, this remote patient management nurse, had other responsibilities within the organization. And while this, we were able to pull off early on, um, it got to a place where it was just too much to manage. And if we wanted to do it right, we needed somebody dedicated to the coordination of it, the evaluation of it, instead of using shared resources, which we did at first. So we did, we hired a, a registered nurse who, who took over this program and is now coordinating efforts and evaluating and, and improving and, and really identifying best practice. Developing strong relationships with the patients by conducting virtual visits for the first seven days. This is something we did not do as well in the beginning. We would have a virtual visit if the patient requested or if needed. And now I think it's, it's so important to us that that remote patient management nurse check in with them these first seven days to one, build that relationship, two, let them know that this isn't some gimmick or just some other piece of technology you have. There are real people here who, who know you're not feeling well and want to take care of you. So, so now when the patient leaves, that first seven days, that nurse is calling them at a predetermined time and checking on them every day. Reinforcing with patients the importance of that care plan completion and, and reporting of symptoms. Um, you know, we, we had a patient that was not telling us um, what was going on with that UTI or not going on with some of their other conditions, and, and we just didn't know, and, and maybe we weren't asking the right questions. Um, so I think, you know, in those first seven days, constantly reinforcing with them 
look, make sure you take care of this care plan. The doctor now can see how you're answering every question and can better take care of you, um, as well as make sure you're telling me how you feel every day. And then lastly, institute protocols for natural disasters. Um, I'm not sure the locations of you guys. We are down in South Louisiana, and obviously we have hurricanes four months out of the year. Um, believe it or not, in the heart of this, uh, program. You guys may remember um, the, the disastrous flooding in Baton Rouge and Lafayette uh, the summer of 2016. It was some called the 1,000 year flood. And um, literally 80% of our communities in Baton Rouge and in Lafayette were underwater. Um, and we lost a couple kits in that flood. We didn't have protocols in place for a natural disaster. Um, and, and now we will we'll be more prepared as we move forward. So the last slide here before we start some question and answer is really our scalable solutions, you know, where we see this going and, and how we can get there. Um, we feel like as a, as a physician practice, we're going to invest in the bring your own device option with Vivify uh, to better control costs. You know, like I said, at this point, the physicians are, are bearing the, the cost of this uh, from a resource perspective, from an equipment perspective, because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, but as you all know, that's not sustainable. And, and so for us, as we continue to wait, perhaps for hospital funding or CMS funding, uh, we feel like we need to invest in the bring your own device option because it is less expensive. We want to develop, further develop our command center and our virtual care center infrastructure, add more team, more resources, more technology, um, so that in that 24 seven care center, We've got the folks able to take care of our patients at the right time. Again, we the goal in quarter two of 2018 is to put a physician in there during office hours, and, and then towards the end of 2018, have a physician uh, in there 24-7. Add more providers to the re remote patient management team. Um, I feel like um, in, in many cases, um, you know, we didn't have enough physician insight or nurse practitioner insight to, to be on the team. We, we, we chose a few guys uh, with, with specific expertise, but I think engaging more of our doctors, like I said, we have 56 doctors, and I don't think I mentioned, but we have 45 nurse practitioners. So we're talking more than 100 providers. Um, there are more unique levels of expertise and unique insight into these conditions and how we can do this program. And I think as we scale, we'd want to get more folks on the team. And then closely monitor CMS for bundles and readmission penalties. Um, in some of our areas, um, and, and I'm not going to you know, state an opinion, good or bad, on this, but some of our hospitals are still making money on readmissions, uh, meaning while they may have received a penalty in 2017, uh, the idea that the patient came back and received care generated more revenue than the penalty. So how willing are hospitals at this point going to be in investing in these types of strategies um, when, when frankly, the bottom line is still not being affected. Again, right or wrong, I'm just saying what it is. So, so I think obviously we know the, the acute amount of cabbage bundle did not make it. Um, and, and so we're going to continue to monitor that, monitor penalties, monitor who's affected, um, and, and, and monitor for bundles. And then lastly, uh, for us, continuously engage hospital partners. Again, the uniqueness here is we're the physician group. We feel like we're uniquely qualified to take care of cardiac patients. We've got the infrastructure. We've got the experience of the technology. So for us, we want to bring this service to, to, to many hospital partners, all, not only our partners, but other hospitals that, that may be interested in this service. So that, that concludes um, the, the, the webinar. That's 30 minutes. Uh, I wanted to really speak around that time. This could give us some you know, opportunity for some question and answers and, and any other type of, uh, of information sharing that's needed. So thank you very much, and I appreciate Kyle and Marcus participating, and we'll be happy to to take any questions you guys may have. Jake, Jake, if this is Terry, and uh, questions are definitely coming in. Uh, the first question is from Will. Um, can you describe or, or define patient compliance? This is something that typically impacts any initiative that we put out there. Um, what what do you mean by patient compliance, and what what have you seen? patient compliance be on this platform? So patient compliance was specific to the amount of times they checked in and did their care plan. And, and so of the of that 35, 75% of those patients were compliant with their care plan daily. That's how we're currently measuring compliance. And actually it's built into the analytics that Vivify Health provides. 
And the, oh, wait. excellent. Second question is from Arthur, and uh, he's from the Netherlands, and he said uh, doctors are uh, quite defensive at looking at charts and data, and what challenges have you faced um, given that this information is so widely shared on this platform, and, and how have you addressed that issue? Um, well, I, I would say uh, as far as the physician defensiveness is concerned, um, our doctors absolutely welcomed the, the additional data and the additional information on their patient. And I, I think that the doc, if, if it's one of his patients and that patient was admitted to the hospital uh, for their heart failure, the idea that now we would get daily data that we relied on and trusted um, to that physician's inbox in his EHR daily, he not only was, you know, welcomed it, was excited about it. So we never found any defensiveness there from our physicians. Um, and I guess the second part of the question, uh, I'm not sure I understand. I think, I think one thing for, for us, this is Kyle, um, is say Marcus and I have very close relationships uh, with these physicians. Uh, we practice with them in and out daily across the company. Um, so they look towards us to kind of scrub down the data um, so they didn't have this overwhelming uh, data. Um, we looked at it, we scrubbed it down daily, and, and then alerted them. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the keys that actually worked well for this project. Yeah, and this is Marcus. So the physicians were also excited to have this knowledge because before they had nothing. I mean, you relied on a, a, a patient to hopefully perform a blood pressure or heart rate log and, and bring it to the next uh, provider visit where now they have the, like we had mentioned, a, a continuous daily report and account, and then also have a lifeline to reach out and actually request a virtual visit with a provider or a nurse um, to, to kind of put their mind at ease from a patient's perspective. So the, pa the, the physicians were super excited to offer, a, number one, a patient, uh, a lifeline, but also the physician a more information for them to, to base their practice and their judgment off of. Um, on their follow-up, whether it was six months or a year later. And if, and if Arthur was, you know, perhaps the second part of the question that I'm not sure I understood, if he was saying, you know, the, the data be so widely available, if he's referencing to our call center, again, our, our nurse practitioners and all of, of our physicians have collaboratives, and, and the, this nursing call center uh, was actually an initiative led by our physicians to better take care of their patients 24-7. So, so if a nurse or another provider separate from that physician was getting this data, uh, our physicians were more than happy, uh, you know, to, to allow them to do that. Yeah, and that's exactly where Arthur was going. So one is it sounds like um, that the patient is partnering with the physician and the clinical team in their care, which is a huge plus. And then secondly, by sharing the data, it helps facilitate the interpretation of the data so that it can be more actionable. That's right. Excellent. Um, next question is from Patricia, and I think this is a great question. How were patients identified and triggered for cardio at home care? Is there a trigger in CPOE? Um, and then second, how far away is the car center from the hospital where the kit is initiated? Okay, that's, that's a good question. So in, in this case, the, the first part of the question, um, that care was initiated. I'm not sure what software Marcus and Kyle could maybe speak to that, but but again, our employees were on site in this hospital. So we are consulted on every cardiac admit. And so if, if the diagnosis was for congestive heart failure or if it was an acute MI patient, our nurses inside the hospital, embedded inside the hospital, are the ones who are aware of this program. And so they would go in, assess the patient, do the criteria with the patient, and then would put in the orders you know, or, or talk to the physician about putting in the orders the cardiac at home program for follow up. So the way we found them inside the hospital was with our own team, because again, the way we operate in the hospital is through a co-management agreement where we actually manage the entire CV service line. And, and then the second part before Kyle and Marcus jump in is, is our call center is in a city called Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, and from this hospital specifically, it was 30 minutes away. Um, but but keep in mind, we, we this call center also services everywhere from Mississippi to Alabama. We even are providing some services in Dubai. And, and so we feel like with technology the way it is, you can set up a command virtual center anywhere and connect to patients all over the world. 
Anything else on the identification, how we identified in the hospital? No, I know in Epic you can build it in and you can make it an order. So you know, if you would decide to do a you know a cardio home type program, you could definitely put it in as an order um, in Epic and build that in Epic. Yeah, and from where from Opelousas general standpoint, they, we were at a disadvantage because they were transitioning from a written uh, system to an uh, EMR system, and so they, there was no trigger, so say, as far as for something that to alert us that this patient was in for a diagnosis of CHF or acute MI or yeah. some sort like that. So it was, it was heavily relied on the staff that were there on the ground level in the hospital. Yeah. And that hospital now has Cerner. Is that available now in Cerner? Is that how we're going to do it at Lafayette General moving forward? Uh, I think you can put it. You can build it. Yeah, you can build it into to most EHRs. Excellent. Um, next question is from Janelle. Can you elaborate on the role of the full-time RN um, while assessing the overall coordination and management? Are they also in charge of monitoring patients? Yes, yeah, so that is that is their full job. So they basically are, are the nurse who helps develop um, the criteria with the physician and provider team. They are the ones who coordinate with the hospital staff, the, the medical director at the hospital, the chief medical officer, chief nursing officer with these hospitals in which this program is happening. So they become the point person. They become the salesperson for this program. Um, they become the one who meets the patients and then monitors throughout and actually uh, generates the escalation criteria. You know, at, at this point, we're comfortable with this remote patient management nurse. Uh, monitoring between 75, 50 to 75 kits at a time. We've heard somewhere along the lines of that, that 100 is probably the right number, that, that one skilled registered nurse or FTE could manage uh, 100 patients via the Vivify system. We're around 75 now because we just want to be safe, but, but they, they do it all. And, and again, they're not alone on an island here. They do have a nurse practitioner who is their one up. They have executive resources such as myself uh, and, and our VP of nursing services who acts as our chief nursing officer in our practice. So there are tons of resources, um, you know, really kind of around this nurse. Um, but as far as the day-to-day -day enrolling patients and monitoring patients and then evaluating those patients is done by this nurse. Excellent. And a number, an, another operations type question is what was the frequency of after hours calls in the 24 hour call center? Um, I would say that they, they were infrequent in this initial implementation. Um, we probably got two to three a week after hours, more on the weekends. Um, and, and we were surprised by that, to be honest with you. We, we felt like there would be more after hours and weekend uh, involvement, but, but up to this point in this initial implementation and in our new programs here, uh, we have not seen a lot of, of after hours and weekends. And I think uh, I'll come in on that. You know, with the, the program we developed and the patient knows that we'll be getting in touch with them over the next uh, seven days, they know about what time we'll be uh, calling in and talking to them. So they have their list of questions. So a lot of them have, you know, waited, oh, I have a question, but I'll wait till tomorrow and ask that. So with, I think with us being in, in such constant contact with them, um, it actually reduced the number of after hours calls, which I think was surprising to myself. I, I anticipated that we'd have more um, than we did. We actually had less. And, and I also comment that, you know, home health helped us a lot on the weekend uh, side of things because they were able to be in the homes uh, during that period of time. But even though we instructed the patients that this was a 24 hour service, it's not a common thing and it's still not a common thing to, to have a provider practice that is available 24 yeah. hours a day. So a lot of times, you know, I would imagine that the patients thought, oh, it's after five, nobody's there. So yeah. even though we instructed them that this was a 24-hour uh, program, you know, it just common knowledge in the past has, has altered that. That's right. And so I think two things there, one being very proactive. Um, again, if, if the idea is let's kind of limit our exposure after hours, um, you know, being very proactive in your daytime operations, that, that seven virtual calls, that, you know, in a row. Um, and, then, and then the second thing, um, you know, having that patient, uh, ha having those partnerships and the multidisciplinary team, that relationship with home health to handle some of the weekend in-home stuff uh, is vital. Excellent. And shifting from operational to some technology questions, 
Um, this is from Laura. Are there any technologies, APIs, tools, or software or integration changes um, that you learned about or that you would suggest as implementing a program like this? Yeah, so we are. I feel like um, right now we are, our EHR is a little unique in that, that it's, it's very proprietary. One of our cardiologists, um, while doing his interventional cardiology training, developed an interest in coding and programming. Um, you know, talk about interesting. So, so one of our interventional cardiologists actually created with a team of engineers the EHR that we use it's called Objective Medical Systems. So one of our cardiologists built it really for a cardiology group. Um, it's, it's excellent for what we do, but it's not mature enough yet to really have a complex integration capability. Now it can, and, and we do mostly the CCD document. We do the direct messaging. Uh, so OMS can direct message those transition of care documents to Epic, Cerner, and some of the bigger EHRs. Um, we, we have not found challenges yet there. We, we do have, you know, so we use Vivify Health as, as one of our options. We also use another device that's actually a wearable um, that, that is interface um, with our EHR because we use it for remote telemetry uh, for patients with pacemakers or any arrhythmia issues. And, and so there is some integration and, and some that we don't have yet, um, but I envision that stuff becoming more sophisticated down the road. Excellent. And then we have time for one more question, and I think this is a, is a great impact question. Have you been able to reduce hospital length of stay due to the earlier discharge um, in this program? The answer is yes. Um, so a, a couple times, and again, unfortunately, um, we've gotten more sophisticated now in the way in which we're tracking this. But, but early on, and Marcus even alluded to it, the hospital that we began this initial program in was still on paper charts. So, so the idea of, of sophisticated data tracking and infrastructure was just not available. And we, we did some of it on our own, but, but anecdotally, there was a significant reduction as the attending uh, knew that this patient was all set up with a remote monitoring kit and the cardiologist was going to be seeing the patient daily. The patient was discharged much quicker. And, and again, I think we're also uniquely equipped to better facilitate that too, because our physicians are the consulting physician, it's our patient, and so we can help you know, manage that discharge a lot sooner, and, and the attending or the primary or the hospitalist is much more comfortable letting that patient go home knowing that, that we're monitoring. In all of our programs moving forward, we will have a metric in there that tells us how long the patient stayed versus average length of stay. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, this was um, uh, very, very informative. The work that you're doing is um, just in truly incredible. Any closing comments before I wrap up and uh, let our audience know how they can get a copy of the recording from today's session? You know, I would say that, that if any of you guys are, are interested in this and want to learn more, please reach out. I mean, I think for us, we we are very satisfied with the Vivify technology. We're very satisfied with the infrastructure and the program we have. Um, we're very interested in growing it if anybody's interested in the service. I think we're also very interested in, in helping support those who are trying to do it themselves uh, just because we think the impact it has on our patients and on the way in which the healthcare system as a whole is managing people uh, we're very interested in helping there. So, so you know, please reach out. We're a very transparent and open organization. Um, I think we just want to do the right thing. And, and so please feel free to reach out. And, and I think that the last thing I would say is um, we feel the need to take risks in our organization. And this was obviously a risk. This is something that we had no funding for. We had some staff for, but we really built a 24-7 call center. And we created these different, you know, technology interventions based on risk. And I think two years in now, we're, we're starting to see that reward. And, and I think that's another thing that I would leave you guys with is don't be afraid to take the risk. I think ultimately, if, if, if the mission and the inspiration is to better take care of people, you can't go wrong. That's a great way to end. Uh, Jacob, you, you and your team are phenomenal. This has been one of the best webinars that I've had the pleasure of facilitating. Um, your contact information is on the screen. You can reach out to 
Jacob or to me on LinkedIn um, uh, if you'd like to uh, get some more information on um, the Cardiovascular Institute of the South or on Vivify. Uh, for those of you uh, who had to sign off early, we will be making a recording of this available. For those of you that stayed throughout, we will also be making that recording available. We'll get back to you in a couple of days with a link so that you can download it. Uh, and again, Jacob, uh, the work that you guys are doing is truly revolutionary and it's going to save a lot of lives. So thank you all very much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you.